Hello, my name is Ran and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart and David Packman. David Packman is a prominent Melbourne-based meditation guide and mindset coach. He runs regular classes about town and from his own studio, The Fifth Direction, in Albert Park, Melbourne. David is the current president of Meditation Australia, the national peak body that represents meditation and meditation teachers. I haven't known David for long, but he has influenced the way I see the world greatly. So before I get into this conversation, I just want to give some background on my personal history for context. Now, near the start of 2015, I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and later that year, my stomach was removed. It was an incredible roller coaster of a time, and I don't want to go into it too much right now, but there were at least a couple of points where I came face to face with my own mortality. Luckily, I made it through all of that, and I'm kind of glad to have had that experience, as traumatic as it was. Now, fast forward a couple of years later, and I became aware that David was holding a Meditations on Death workshop, so I decided to go along. Now, this doesn't reflect on me too well, but I turned up to the workshop with my own preconceptions and judgments. I felt that this was something I knew about, maybe even a bit of a scare quote expert on. Somehow I'd made it all about me. At the workshop, however, I was immediately and utterly humbled by David's intelligence, his wisdom, and the lessons he'd learned through his own experience, which he was generous enough to share. David has an incredible life story, and I am so glad to be able to bring this episode out for you. David Packman, thanks so much for welcoming us into your home. It's a beautiful place here, and perhaps you could tell us a bit about your background and where you grew up. Sure, firstly, welcome. It's Thank my you. pleasure to have you here at the Fifth Direction, as I like to call this studio. I grew up in Melbourne. I grew up in the southeast suburbs. Typical childhood, I guess, in Melbourne. I went to school here, went to university here. There was a connection to Byron Bay. My parents, we had a house there, and quite soon, when my sister and I became young adults, they moved up there. So then there was this very strong link up there, so I spent an awful lot of time up there. I eventually moved up there after university, and things went from there, I guess. And is that where you discovered meditation? To some degree, yes. My mum was big on meditation, a little bit of a Buddhist influence there, but also uh, later in life very heavily into Kundalini. So that was kind of my first introduction, I guess, to meditation. And Um, so did you meditate when you were a kid? Was that part of family life? I don't know if you'd call it meditation. Uh, (laughs) Yes, you know, but but yeah, I mean, more about witnessing mum, I guess, Mm -hmm. and just Mm -hmm. being a part of that kind of process. And just so, things will live their life like that. Yeah, that's right. And you know, being in your bedroom and hearing chanting and stuff coming from the other room. It kind of, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? It kind of like, it, it does. And then having a calm mum after that. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Calmer, perhaps. <laughs> I, I wonder, I guess, when you're a child and your parents are doing some sort of activity, you're not necessarily as interested in, in that type of activity. So did, did you have any sort of resistance to to what was going on there at all? Yeah, it's, it's a good point, Rain, because particularly as a rebellious teenager, mm-hmm. so there was certainly a stage when I would label what mum was doing as kind of weird, you know, mm-hmm. ridiculous mum, the hippie sort of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you definitely do go the other way. There's no question about it. But interestingly, as I'm sure we'll discuss, when life starts to happen to you in ways that mm-hmm. you haven't planned for, then you start to realise that, Mum was onto something. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from your parents, did you have any other sort of early teachers in meditation? I had a lot of early teachers for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Not, not so much in meditation, no. Mm-hmm. But you know, looking back, there were definitely people that were educating me in life. Mm-hmm. No doubt about that. You know, I mean, beyond my parents, of course. But mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. Specifically, meditation, probably not so much. I guess mm-hmm. once you know, getting involved with the culture and community up in Byron Bay was probably the next step mm-hmm. after mum meeting a lot of I guess like-minded people to mum mm-hmm. uh, and being exposed to a lot more 
yeah, a lot more things like meditation, kind of, mm. I guess, alternative type stuff. Mm-hmm. So it started to sink in and started to become meaningful for me at that point. Um, so just to change the topic a, a little bit, uh, we noticed while doing some research uh, that you used to be a hot air balloon pilot. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. How did you get involved in that? Uh, yeah, that links. It's probably it's probably not so much of a of a of a moving topic because that that happened in Byron Bay as well. Ah. So. Oh, what a beautiful place to fly on air Yeah. So the truth of the matter is, I was actually at a, a concert and yeah, listening to a gig, and I met a guy in a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I literally was standing next to this American guy and. As happens late at night, you start having some sort of a rambling conversation and he, he was a hot air balloon pilot. And there, there was a hot air balloon company which had literally just sprung up flying balloons over Byron Bay, which you right, beautiful place to fly. And this balloon, was, I've even seen it, it was like beautiful royal blue with gold dolphins all the way around it. Oh, I remember wow. it, yeah, it was just amazing. But So yeah, so I ran into um, Sean and we ended up chatting for a while at, at this gig and, and he was going flying the next morning and he saw how interested I was and he was like well if you stop drinking right now and go home <laughs> and, and, you know because I'm leaving go to sleep and you want to meet me and he gave me a place to meet at like you know 5 30 a.m he said come along and and you can go for a balloon ride so the very next morning you know fantastic there I was up in the sky and I was I was immediately just obsessed with it so yeah things unraveled from there I guess in terms of getting involved with the industry and mm-hmm. Before I knew it, I was I was over in France and you know doing it basically, wow. and that, that ended up as a sort of five year odyssey of sort of working with hot air balloons all around the world. Wow. So an amazing adventure for a young guy in his early twenties. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there any parallels between flying hot air balloons and guiding meditations? <laughs> I probably haven't thought of it. Yes, no, yes, without a doubt. I mean, yeah, I mean up up there. You know, hot air balloon, you're sort of moving with the weather system. So mm. I guess, you know, so you don't kind of feel wind on your face too much. You kind of just, because you're moving with the whole system, right? You can't so, struggle against yeah, it. Yeah, you can't struggle against it. I mean, I'm looking for analogies now, but, but you're right. It's, there's a certain similarity there. And plus the state of mind that you're in up there. It's pretty peaceful. Mm. Seems so like it would be pretty serene. It's, mm. Yeah, it's pretty, it's very gentle and... and Although I'm not sure if you took up many passengers, I'd imagine that you'd have to deal with the occasional freak out as well and someone... It's, it's actually strange because over five years, I didn't really have all that many people. I had people who, who were apprehensive at first, but it didn't, once we were up, it, it didn't carry over. I guess there's that serene feeling, like you're not feeling buffeted around in turbulence. and. Yeah, there's that. And also a lot of people's fear of heights, it's actually the attachment to the ground. Like they don't like being on top of a tall building, but they're still they're still attached to the ground. Mm-hmm. And this is I'm sort of this is what I've been told anyway. That sometimes once that stops happening, then once the attachment's gone, then some of the fear goes away. You just in a different space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess for people who are sort of afraid of flying, you know, quote unquote. I guess yeah, the lack of being buffeted around and stuff. Because sometimes if I get someone to like not to close their eyes, sometimes they don't even know that we've taken off ah. and then they sort of get them to open their eyes and they'll be like a hundred feet off the ground already and they're like oh and something shifts i guess but interestingly enough just as a as a side note the worst passenger i ever had in terms of white knuckles was my best friend <laughs> <laughs> he was just he was pretty much the only person i ever had who was just like just you know frightened from start to finish mm-hmm. and it was like it happened to be my best friend it was really weird <laughs> yeah it's not that much though because I think sometimes if people don't know you yeah they just see you as the pilot and they're in safe hands and you know you're in total control yeah. and but if it's just your mate yeah they'll be like what are you doing flying a balloon yeah. you're just my mate <laughs> yeah. yeah he knows how rubbish I am <laughs> <laughs> I guess they gave you something to rag on him a bit after. Oh, <laughs> honestly, that was 25 years ago and he still hasn't heard the end of it. So. <laughs> I know you spent some time working in the corporate world. I actually would like to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you're going quite nicely because you're moving through my life in a chronological order. So, um, towards the, well, I ended up working for a hot air balloon company and I kind of because it was a small company I ended up by default as kind of the PR marketing guy within this company Mm -hmm. 
so I started to dabble because at the end of the day, what, what's a hot air balloon? It's basically like a moving billboard, right? So we were like, <laughs> we were like selling advertising space mm-hmm. to, you know, really it was just to fuel a passion for our own hobby. But mm-hmm. in the end, it kind of became a business, yeah. So we're working with some pretty big companies like BBC and lots of lots of sort of companies of that ilk. So I ended up in this role where I was having conversations with real people in the corporate world. Mm. And when I left Europe and stopped flying balloons, I went to Africa for a while and just kind of wanted to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I wrote a whole bunch of letters to PR agencies without really much of a background in PR because, you know, my CV was all about flying balloons and not much else. And at that stage, I had really long hair and I wasn't looking exactly corporate. So, but one person, mentor of mine, felt into the letter and felt that I'd be an interesting person to meet. And when I got back to Australia, there was a note from him or a letter, as it was in those days before email, saying, come and meet me. So I did and he offered me a job on the spot at one of the largest PR agencies in the world. He didn't even have a... I remember his line, he said something like, I just want you working in the office. Like, he didn't even have a job. He said, I just will figure it out later. So I was basically like, you know, opening his mail, not doing that much. But I kind of worked my way up from there. A couple of years later, I was I was a director and it kind of just went from there. Wow. Yeah, so that was kind of how it started. But in the end, I ended up working for AOL, AOL Time Warner, mm-hmm. living for a while in London, Hong Kong. In a relatively senior position, so that's how my corporate. So you know, I've just covered nearly twenty years there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but, and obviously that kind of came to an end, and you're ready to move on to a new phase. Is there a? Yeah, you know, lots of reasons for that. It was getting pretty stressful. Time Warner bought AOL, and a lot of things were changing, and I was really tired of all the travel, and you know, I had quite a lot of responsibility, and yeah, I was sort of looking ahead and seeing the next promotion and looking mm-hmm. at that guy and going, well, actually, I don't want to be that guy. He's, like, really stressed and, you know... Yeah, that's not improved. Yeah, his, his, like, relationship with... He doesn't have one with his family and mm-hmm. and doing quite well. And I'm like, hey, you know, this does not seem like much of a progression plan. And I just started to ask a few questions about why I was doing that, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, a lot of it came down to that internal conversation. It was like, my dad was a businessman. And I was like, am I just doing the thing because mm. like, this is what yeah yeah, is. yeah yeah and you know what am I basing my model of a fulfilled life on here and I just you know wanting to I don't know yeah just move you know just go through the motions basically and do what my dad did and and it, it just wasn't sitting well with me at all even back then it just started to feel really incongruent to who I was as a person mm-hmm. and were you meditating regularly then as well I'll look a little bit it wasn't I wouldn't call it a you know like a a daily practice or anything but there was a little bit going on but yeah it was, it was more just at that time in my life it was more just this disconnect you know when I was flying hot air balloons and I had long hair I always used to say I'll never wear a suit and I'll never do this and I'll do that and this is me I'm this kind of free spirited person and then you fast forward like nearly 20 years and and I've been stuck in the corporate world living you know in the cut and thrust of Hong Kong and London and wearing a suit every day and I was kind of like how, how did this happen <laughs> yeah so there was this this massive disconnect and it felt like it felt like something was was wrong inside me Mm -hmm. and it was playing out you know it was playing out in anxiety and depression and lots of different ways so something had to give so what did you do (laughs) well I quit Mm -hmm. and I came back to Australia that was yeah a lot to do with how I was feeling personally but also at that time both my sister and my mum had some health challenges so there were some other compelling reasons to come home so it was it was about me but it was also about about them as well mm-hmm. you know I wasn't intending then to, to stop working in the corporate world but I was intending I just needed to make a big shift so my intention was to actually come home and start my own company which I did mm-hmm. a PR company you briefly mentioned your own anxiety and depression mm. coming up. Mm. Um, I often read about meditation being really helpful for anxiety and depression and studies around that. And then other articles as well saying that it's contraindicated if you've got those kind of mental health issues. So I'd love to know your thoughts about when you feel like it can be helpful and when it's not so appropriate or if it's all just a matter of maybe having a guide to help you. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And... It's probably not a straightforward answer. Yeah, there's not um, a right answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, look, I think in, in most cases, finding the right form of meditation or mindfulness practice 
for yourself is definitely beneficial. There's no doubt about that. And there's been tons of research to, to bear that out. And even more interestingly, I know we're going to get on to talking about the Wim Hof method at some point, but there's now even research coming out to show how that's particularly helpful, but mm-hmm. perhaps for another reason around inflammation in the brain, which is tackling it, I guess, in a slightly different way. But yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying in terms of the, the counter the counter indications for it. And yeah, there is things like often referred to as dark night syndrome mm-hmm. where you know you sit down you meditate you're already depressed and anxious and suddenly you're confronted with you know stuff that you've been sort of holding back mm-hmm. and that can be too much and that's called you know really that, that that's what happens in dark night syndrome but I think generally speaking um, in a guided way I think by far and away I think the benefits outweigh any of those you know, minor risks for a very small selection of people that that might happen to but i don't know i have this thing around meditation that anything that happens in terms of benefits in your life should really be considered a byproduct so if i'm sitting down to meditate with an agenda that i that that i want my depression to be is what my i think that's counterintuitive Mm -hmm. like i always say to people when they sit down to meditate surrender the agenda Mm. You're just meditating for meditation's sake. Like you can't and go in there with a shopping list. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, otherwise you just, you've got an expectation in mind and then the mind is busy waiting for that to eventuate. And then you feel like you failed. And well, you... well, then you, well, you set up the opportunity yeah. to succeed or fail, which is, which is not the point. So, yeah, for me, you just meditate. It's, it should just be part of it. You're, you know, an integral part of, of what you do as a human being. And mm. if a byproduct of that is that you become happier or you become less anxious and depression well that's a fantastic byproduct but can't be the priority or or what you're focusing on expecting to happen Mm, yeah Mm. definitely Mm. yeah i guess that whole thing is quite counterintuitive because you know we're told we should do meditation because it does all these things but Mm. once you do it (laughs) you shouldn't be doing it for all these reasons yeah well that's right (laughs) but but it's a bit like you know i mean we we talk about happiness in the same way Mm. like so for me that's a symptom of the way our minds have been conditioned to think now mm. you know we see happiness as some sort of destination mm. when in fact you know if you just live your life in a way that's conducive for happiness then happiness will become a byproduct but it's not the end goal people always talk about the pursuit of happiness and i sort mm. of say it's actually more about the happiness of the pursuit mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nice yeah. yeah i think as well sometimes just like our minds work as human beings it's like we can put limits on ourselves about, like I often kind of notice this happening with work or with a big project, like, yep, I'll just get this big project done and then I'll have time to like look after myself and to meditate and mm. then I'll be happy and relaxed. Mm. And it's like, you never get to that point when you magically have all of this time to do these things. No. And these are the practices that help you the most when you're in the middle of that stressful I, I, time. Yeah, this is exactly true. And I, I, I was recently reading a book called Die Wise. I don't know if you've heard of Stephen Jenkinson. Mm-hmm. But he was talking about this and he was like, all the way up until our deaths, we, we do all these things to buy more time, to have more time with the kids, to have more of the, But, you know, all we're doing is actually that part of it. So we're just buying more time to buy more time. Mm-hmm. And we never actually use that time to do the things that we're buying more time for, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah we kind of we run our whole lives in this, oh, if I, if I just do this, then I'll have more time for that. And, but it's, it's just, it just plays on itself. So mm-hmm. all we're ever doing is trying to buy more time. I work really hard and then mm-hmm. I'll have time to relax. Yeah. yeah. You know, and he talks about it in Diawise, he's talking about it in the, cons, in the, in the, in the face of death. And he's saying you do all these things towards the end of your life to, to buy more time if you're ill or whatever. And, and he says to have more time to be with the kids, and, but then you die. Yeah. And it's like all you've done is the more time bit. You never actually did play with the kids more <laughs> or you never used what, whatever it is you were aiming to get. Does that... Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Seeing as we're on, on the subject, one of my first exposure to, to your teachings was uh, at the Meditations on Death workshop, which I actually found sort of deeply moving and just uh, a wonderful uh, experience. So I was wondering perhaps you could talk about what that is and perhaps your reasonings for bringing it out into the world. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's something that's very close to my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, this discussion of death because i think it's 
probably the last taboo. I think things are changing more recently. I think it's been put on the table a lot more often than it used to be even five years ago. But it's one of these topics that we as humans don't like to talk about. We spend so much time having a relationship with death at a subconscious level. We don't yet, at a conscious level, we spend all our time trying to avoid thinking about it. So there's a massive kind of disconnect between what's going on within and, and what's going on in the, in the part of our brains that, that we're in most in the conscious, yeah? Mm-hmm. So, you know, every time we stop at the side of the street and look left and right and before we cross the road, we're, we're having a, a relationship with death. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, whilst they say they're comfortable with death and they get it, yep, yeah, sure, one day I'm going to die, it, it's very... It's, a veneer, it's, it's just a veneer to cover up a, a massive denial. Mm-hmm. And I think by... By far, most people that are walking around are are in some form of denial of death. And what does that then do? Because if that's what's driving your decisions at a subconscious level, that you're going to live forever, then you make very bad decisions. You know, I I boil it all the way back down to saying, see you soon when when you leave a friend at a restaurant or something. Well, that's quite presumptuous. Mm -hmm. Yet we see see it as fact. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see this person again. So we go see you soon and it's all lovely. Well, how do you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that's probably not the last thing that you wished you would have said to that person if something happens to them because it's a, a mistruth. Mm-hmm. So I think you'd be far better saying something far more meaningful like, I love you. And Absolutely. it just everything mm-hmm. just kind of boils down from there. So what I do in this workshop is we actually have a discussion about death we bring these topics up on on the table and we and then we do a, a meditation a deathbed meditation mm-hmm. and yeah it can be quite quite profound um, mm-hmm. i did one recently and someone came up to me afterwards and they were saying how deeply conditioned the denial of death was in them to the point where when they were a little boy if he was in the family car and a hearse drove by his mum would literally shriek look the other way look the other way and and i was thinking that's how deeply rooted in terms of the conditioning it can be that death is this horribly fearful thing that you know or, and it's just let's just pretend it, it just doesn't even exist mm-hmm. and that that's a mistake because we can actually use the fact that we're going to die to really fuel a, a very fulfilling life mm-hmm. you know like the see you soon versus I love you mm. if you base your decisions with 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 death front and center i think you're going to make much wiser choices mm-hmm. um, and you find people on their deathbed suddenly have that insight mm-hmm. because well, they can see it mm-hmm. and everything changes for them but it's a shame i know i often say death is wasted on the dying <laughs> 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 but you see where i'm coming from when, mm-hmm. I, when i say that and our whole life the way we've we've our society's gears towards a denial of death actually mm-hmm. like again taken from Stephen Jenkinson, you think of the word mortgage. You know, mm-hmm. um, if you break that word down, it's mort, death, and gauge, calibrated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> calibrated death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you think about what a mortgage is, it's exactly that. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Yeah, it, uh, it's, really, it's a really interesting topic because, you know, it, I guess it affects each, each of us as an individual and we sort of as a collective sort of spread that confusion about it into the world and so our whole society perhaps is sort of just a little bit twisted because of of this denial and I know from you know my own experience with with illness and getting a you know a misdiagnosis you sort of you can think you say well I'm ready to die if that's going to be the case but when a doctor's telling you that it's a whole different ball game and you know I I rapidly discovered that I, I wasn't ready to die <laughs> yeah it's easy to be ready for something when you don't think it's actually going to happen to you anytime yeah. soon but it is it, Matt, that's the point you know, we don't think it's going to happen to us anytime soon mm. but the reality is it's going to we could die at any, and also at any mm. moment you know I always go back to you know the stoic philosophers were very very good at talking about death mm. and Marcus Aurelius said you could leave life at any moment let that power what you do think and say and i think that's really profound to be honest mm-hmm. yeah but you're right i you mean to be confronted with it's very different from 
having it sort of hanging around you in theory. And mm-hmm. I, I found because I work with a lot of men too in you know the men's circles that I run, and particularly men, you know, we had the discussion about death, and like, yeah, mate, no worries. I'm not worried about dying. <laughs> and that's just the, the outer armour. Like, uh, you, you're meant to be... The, the, the fear of death is healthy mm. to the degree that at least you understand the gravity of it. Like, mm. to say flippantly, she'll be right, mate, yeah, mm. I'm going to die, that's fine, I've got that covered. Um, you haven't. No one has. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, quite, quite laughable to suggest that I've yeah. got that. <laughs> Try it. Ask a couple of your mates. I bet yeah. you most of them would say that. Mm. I'm not afraid to die. Mm-hmm. And it's just this kind of armour which has been put up, which just shows me that they haven't really contemplated it fully. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean we should be afraid of death into the point of where it's like crippling mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. The point is, most things in life, you can be afraid, but you just do it anyway, mm-hmm. right? And that's where, like jumping into an ice bath in, in Wim Hof, I don't like getting in an ice bath. It's bloody cold and I don't like it and it's highly uncomfortable, but mm-hmm. I do it anyway. And it's the same thing when we're approaching death, I think, mm-hmm. which we're all approaching death. Mm-hmm. You know, I often like to say, if you do the hard things, life will be easy. Mm-hmm. If you do the easy things, life will be hard. Mm-hmm. But, you know, keeping death front and centre truly, keeping mm-hmm. it front and centre is one of those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, you kind of hear about family arguments that drag on for 20 years and Mm. people only make that move as to reconnect when someone's ill and they feel like their time is running out and it's like what a waste of time like obviously you got over whatever was bothering you 20 years ago you know like you could have had all of that time together totally and even Mm. people kind of chasing their dreams Mm. or getting out of a job that was making them unhappy yep even starting the podcast was a little bit of a impetus from Ran overcoming his illness and kind of going, oh, I actually want to do all of these things that I want to do in life and not just put it off. Like, I want to start now. 100%. You know, I say to people, don't wait. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of the lessons that death teaches us. Don't wait. And mm-hmm. to what you're saying, I think that's really interesting. It's like when you have a tragedy around you, like, you know, a close friend or a family member dies, you 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 know you hug people tighter and you're kind of full of love and all this sort of stuff but you know why do we need that to actually happen you know if you're keeping death front and center anyway you, you're always like that right because what happens that family member dies and you know but it fades over time doesn't it because the human condition kicks back in and, mm-hmm. and we kind of just go back to the way we were which is this denial. Yeah, yeah. So do we have to keep having people die around us to stay like that? Or, you know, we don't have to. Interestingly, I, was, I, I talk in my workshop about the samurai, you know, the, mm. the death meditations that the samurai do didn't come up in times of war. They came up in times of peace because they'd lost that, you know. They did, when, when they weren't at war, death wasn't nearby. They, society became a little less cohesive. Could you describe the death meditation practice? Well, I mean, the samurai one's different. You know, that's more about... I mean, their mantra... No, that's the one I'm... I'm yeah, 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 yeah. So their mantra is just, you know, today is a great day to die. And just basically owning that from the beginning of your day. And once you own that statement, there's really not a lot that can, mm. can come up which is going to mm. trouble you too much. Mm. But, you know, it also leads you to be much more compassionate, much more loving, all these sorts of things. So... That's really what it's getting at. So, yeah, you know, but you see that happen in society all the time. Like, even here, news readers, to, to a degree, it's like if there's been a great tragedy, they're all like, oh, make sure you hug your kids tighter tonight. It's like, why do I need... Mm-hmm. Yeah, hug but, them tighter yeah, yeah, but all that's happened mm-hmm. is death has come up. But death is always coming up. Mm-hmm. So my view is just do that daily. Mm-hmm. You don't need the actual tragedy. Like, it's there anyway, every time you look in the mirror. Yeah. Mm. See a new wrinkle, whatever. It's like, <laughs> it's coming, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's okay. And that's okay. It's actually nothing to be afraid of at all. But that, that thing, just to talk to that point you were saying about family arguments that, you know, and then it's too late because someone dies or whatever. Mm. It's interesting that, you know, that disconnect happens. You know, Ram Das, who's a great, you know, works with, with dying people and is obviously such an amazing spiritual leader. But... He says that when he walks into a house, what usually happens is the family meets him at the door and they pull him aside and they go, don't tell grandma she's dying, she won't be able to cope, you know? Um, and he goes, okay. And then he, he, he goes in to see grandma, who's you know, in bed, and so he has, has to have a little private conversation and she brings him in close and she says, 
don't tell them I'm dying. <laughs> they won't be able to cope. He says that's like the, 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 the usual scenario. Yeah. And it's like, because we can't talk about it. And it's like, mm-hmm. if you guys, you're on the same page here. Yeah. Just talk about it. Yeah. Grandma's dying. She knows you know. Mm. You know, say the things that you always wanted to say to grandma. Yeah. And vice versa. <laughs> well, I found through my experience that, you know, I was still incredibly fearful around death, and I think I probably still am. And, but I do know that when I do die, I hopefully don't want it to be a terrifying ordeal of struggle. I'm hoping that I could sort of pass on in a, a peaceful manner. I'm not sure how possible that is, but I, I do genuinely feel that these practices of, of yoga and meditation and contemplation of death can um, aid in that process. I, I was wondering what you thought on that. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, the, the, the Buddhist concept of conscious dying, I think, I think is really important in that context. You mm-hmm. know, the idea is, you know, can you go to your death with you know, a purity and a clarity of mind. Mm-hmm. And I think the practice of being prepared for that will, will help with that process. I mean, none of us really know what it's going to actually be like. Mm-hmm. I mean, Michael Barbato has done some terrific scientific research around what happens. He's kind of a death whisperer, a beautiful man. He used to be a country GP who kind of turned to helping walk people home. Mm-hmm. And he did some research about what happens to brain activity um, mm-hmm. I might have mentioned this in the workshop you were in, um, I can't remember, but mm-hmm. um, at, just at the moment of death with a lot of people, there's actually a, a really high, heavy spike in brain activity. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if they're, they're down low because they're in a coma or whatever, but then mm-hmm. right before they pass, it sort of spikes. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to work out what that meant because that's kind of pretty interesting because yeah. it didn't seem to correlate to pain management therapy either. So mm-hmm. even people that were heavily sedated on morphine, you know, you would think that, oh, maybe that won't happen to them because they're so below thought at that point or, you know, deeply asleep. But it, it didn't correlate that, you know, that people on less pain-killing drugs had more of a... It was kind of a bit more random than that. Mm-hmm. But he, they then realised that the brainwave that was happening was actually gamma, and gamma indicates love and compassion. So oh, wow. there seemed to be this spike of love and compassion at the end. Now, what that means, I don't know. You know, are you thinking about your loved ones? Are you, is it self-love? Mm-hmm. Are you seeing God? Mm-hmm. Like, who knows? But to me, if you're asking, like, will it be peaceful and will it be nice? Well, that helps. Yeah. 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 So that's some really interesting research that, that Michael's done there. And I love listening to him. I went and listened to him speak in Sydney a while ago and was just blown away. Mm-hmm. Just the energy of the man, just to, you know, that... Just, I don't know, I think it takes a special person to, to, to do that for a living, to sort of hold the hand of people Definitely. and walking them, walking them to that end stage. What was, you know, we're at the Gola Foundation. Mm-hmm. What was the name of the guy who did that job? You know, the one who did the clown training? We're talking about Patch Adams, Dr. Adams. He did Patch Adams, like he went to that hospital yeah, in right, Russia. Yeah, right, right. Um, German guy. Don't know. We did meditation with him at the Gola. Oh, wow, well, okay. And he did that same, same you stuff. know, he expressed it really beautifully, like... Walking oh, walking people, people home. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's a, yeah. That's a ram, ram-dass thing, since that's all we're actually here for, to help walk each other home. And he was like yeah. such a lively, kind of joy-filled, kind of big, friendly German clownish man. Yeah, yeah. Well. well, they often are. I mean, you've seen, everyone's seen the movie, you know, yeah, Pam Challenge yeah. with Robin Williams. I, he came to Australia. He did a, a workshop, uh, in, actually in Byron Bay, mm-hmm. which I went to, and, and what a guy. I mean, seriously. The first thing he did was this big room full of people. He had to stand up, um, find someone you didn't know, and for two minutes you had to look in their eyes and just say, I love you and then back again the other way and and my story is I had a it was a French guy who was like travelling in Australia sort of backpackery type big tall guy like me like well over well over six foot and so I was looking into this big big guy you know complete stranger's eyes and just saying I love you for like two minutes straight and looking deep in his eyes it was quite profound you know and I was trying to find different ways of doing it like you know like (laughs) intonations of voice just like you know just to make it kind of interesting and so I started saying it in French because you know (laughs) because we introduced each other you know I was just trying to find ways over the two minutes and really trying to you know go deep and then he did it back to me and but I mean amazing workshop but the, the the point of the story is the next day I was walking through town in Byron Bay and I saw 
this guy on the other side of the road on the main street and we caught each other's eyes and we just leapt into each other's eye, uh, arms Aww. like I just ran across the street and, like, and I was like I love you man I love you and he was saying it back to me and I was like that's that's all because of that you know? yeah and, and so to me you know it was yeah pretty profound mm-hmm. I remember from your workshop one of the exercises was to stare into a person's eyes and mm-hmm. contemplate the fact that they were going to die and I found that incredibly moving but I guess my logical mind clipped in and all I could feel is that, you know, if, if this person's going to die, and actually as a side note, I, I find eye gazing really difficult and really uncomfortable, but yeah, if this person's going to die, the only logical thing I can do is offer love and compassion to this person. You know, I guess that's a universal <laughs> from everyone's nodding, but... Yeah, it just sort of, it does seem that if everyone's going to die, then the only thing you can do is offer them love. Mm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just, I'd pull you up there and say, it's, it's not if. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and that's, and that, that's the whole point. Really. Yeah. But, but secondary to that, the fact that you felt love and compassion, that's the way we should operate to every human being mm. because of the fact that they will die if nothing mm. else. Mm. And, and that's what brings beauty into the world. I mean, why do you mm. like a flower, as a, a real rose as opposed to a plastic rose? Because it's going to die. Mm. That's, where the, that's where beauty comes from. It's, it's everything, mm-hmm. right? It's all connected back to that impermanence, you know, in the Buddhist concept where, you know, everything is going to come to an end. Mm-hmm. And the reason we find beauty is because of that. Mm. Um, you know, what makes a relationship with another human being so amazing is the fact that one day you know one of you is going to die and one before the other we don't Mm -hmm. generally have a habit of you know falling over at exactly the same time which means that one person is going to be left in immense grief you don't know when you don't know who and shouldn't that drive every moment with that person to be unbelievably special Mm -hmm. because of the fact that yeah you're both going to die and at different times and there's going to be suffering Mm. so that's you've signed up for that Mm. by being human by being human Mm. exactly so that should drive everything in terms of love and compassion at the root of it is this idea of impermanence and this Mm. idea of death Mm. but we don't take it on and so we don't feel it a lot and we we, we shy away from it because it seems too fearful this might be backtracking a little bit but what actually led you to wanting to become a, a teacher or a guide of meditation? Oh, I guess that's a multifaceted answer. I mean, keeping it, keep, you know, to continue the conversation about death for a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2007, um, my, my sister took her own life. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the beginning of me really kind of turning my own kind of compass inwards and, and really having a look at what was going on, on for me because that was you know devastating of course mm. and that was really when I kind of started to completely pull out of, of working in the corporate world and I was running my own business at that stage but even that you know it sort of scaled down sort of from from the old days but you know I was still traveling a lot and really really busy with work and and when that happened I, again all the questions came up like they did the previous time but much more like you know if that was a, a subtle questioning this was like a sledgehammer between the eyes and, and I guess things like meditation and other kind of internal practices like that started to become more common for me and, I, and I, but then I started realizing the more I did these types of things the more I actually loved them for themselves mm-hmm. and then the idea of kind of sharing that love with other people started to come about you know and these things just strengthen and strengthen because you know three years later um, my mother took her own life as well um, after let me add you know having had you know she was in the in the midst of a a really difficult cancer which Mm -hmm. was which was taking her life very quickly Mm -hmm. and you know but she made the choice to kind of go in her own time which I think is more than fair Mm -hmm. um so yeah, so again, that's you know all that all these kinds of events were were fueling the decision to deepen my practice, and then eventually realizing that it was my it was my purpose mm-hmm. to to then teach it. So yeah, and I think when it's fueled with by lived experience, like in your case, you know, when it's fueled by lived experience, I think the teaching becomes m- more 
powerful in a way mm. um, and people can resonate with that um, rather than sort of just reading it in a textbook mm. yeah uh, it's sort of interesting to me I sort of I sometimes wonder whether I'm being sort of self-indulgent by talking about it but at other times I'm like well you know I think I've actually learned something really valuable from this experience and which makes it worth sharing so it's an interesting struggle for me. <laughs> and you know what? It's, it's, a, it's a struggle that's not uncommon, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you strip it all back, usually where you find your, your genius or where you find your gift of whatever you're going to do in life, it's, it's where your wound is, mm-hmm. you know? So if you look, most people avoid looking at their wounds. But if you turn into it and do the work and dig in and really examine what's going on there it's within that wound that you'll generally find whatever genius you've been given in life. And my idea is once you've uncovered that genius and you've done the bloody hard work to dig through the discomfort and sit in all that pain mm-hmm. to uncover that gem, mm-hmm. then you use that to benefit other people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean what I call giving away the gold, like just telling everybody. Mm-hmm. It's got to be, you've got to use that gift really wisely Mm -hmm. you know can you hold infinite wisdom in your hand so essentially you're containing it Mm -hmm. and then using it purposefully as opposed to just you know like i like you man i I, a lot of people with cancer you know they wear it like a badge of honor and they think that it makes them somehow different and in a sense better Mm because of what they're dealing with somehow Mm -hmm. when not really because you step into other people's shoes and everybody's dealing with it shipload of garbage and also people say that to you as well yeah. like run almost felt a little bit uncomfortable because everyone's like oh you're so brave you're such an inspiration you're just like oh, i'm just being me like, mm, you don't feel it yeah, yeah. You're, you're just, just doing, doing it yeah you're just taking the steps that you need to do to well yeah carry on yeah, yeah. i don't feel particularly brave in what i'm doing i'm just 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 doing the best i can you know it's like mm. but it's interesting though if someone said to me in a three-year span you're gonna you know you're gonna lose your sister and your mum and you're going to get diagnosed with blood cancer I would have been like there's no way I can there's no way that I'm going to be able to handle that mm-hmm. but they happen and, and you do mm-hmm. you know we're really resilient human beings and so yes I think you know there's a lot of courage in there for sure of course no doubt but I think none of us as individuals give ourselves enough credit for what we're capable of mm-hmm. like I wouldn't have before then but now having been through that I feel like I'm quite I feel like you know, I'd say I'm, I'm up for the challenge, mm. um, no matter what happens, because I've learned to sort of lean into that discomfort to a degree. But so I always use the analogy of saying, if you had all the food you were going to eat it for the rest of your life, like sitting in a truck, <laughs> you'd be like, uh, you'd be like, there's no way I can eat all that. But three meals a day, and you eat it all. <laughs> <laughs> We've found it's really shifted our perspective on other things that in the past might have seemed like massive dramas, like maybe something that happened at work or even like a traffic jam or something like that. And then after going through those huge life-changing events, you do you are a little bit more mindful about mm. the things that you give power to and the things mm. that you give importance to. Yeah, and you know, a great litmus test for that is actually going back to the death conversation because it's like layer death on anything that you've been ruminating on for the last week and it automatically loses its power over you. It's like I, I say in the death workshop, I get people to just sit for a couple of minutes and I say, what's been occupying your mind over the last 24, 48 hours? Like what's the thing that's been stuck and that you've had... You know, everyone's got something, right? There's just no doubt about that. And then I say, you know, layer, you know, your, the fact that you could die at any moment, the fact that everyone around you is going to die, layer, layer, just layer death in however that comes up for you over that problem and see it through that lens. And how does it feel? Mm. And it's like, it's just not important. Mm. You know, it's just not important. Like I was, I was laughing because the last because I do it myself so I'm sitting I had a death workshop on Friday night and I was sitting there thinking alright I'm going to do this myself My what came up for me was that I've been I'm, I'm getting one of those a banner made up for the fifth direction you know, one of those standalone ones to go near the ice bath you know and I've been pretty concerned over whether the logo should be horizontal <laughs> or vertical you know and yeah. so that's, that came up for me and, then I, and I just started laughing so I'm like you know big deal yeah. you know I mean it doesn't mean you don't have those thoughts mm-hmm. because you know we, we have to 
live. Mm. But at the same time, you know, just bearing in mind. Yeah, you don't evolve into just super being yeah, who's yeah, not worried yeah, about Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just give it the correct weighting mm. and don't get too wound up. So it's kind of interesting, but as you say, you know, whether it's a diagnosis of cancer, anything can do that. But for me, a nice quick, quick litmus test is we'll just weigh it up in the face of death, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like things like road rage or whatever, it's like, it's very hard to stay angry with someone when you, when you look at them through that lens, yeah. you know, like here's a person who's going to die one day. They've got all the same struggles as me. You know, in fact, if we got out of our cars now and had a chat, we'd, <laughs> we'd, every, we'd be pretty similar, you know, hopes, dreams, fears. Like, really? Am I going to stay mad at this person? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Or someone wrote something I disagree with on the internet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like, let it go, man. Yeah. Mm. In leading your workshops and in leading the other meditations that you do, is it something that you think about? The difference between, or the balance between kind of guiding and shaping someone's experience and giving them space and freedom to have their own experience... And is that something that happens intuitively or consciously? Um, there's probably lots of little little things in that question. It's quite a big question, yeah. actually. Probably f- the first thing that I would say is I'm, and I can get in trouble for saying this, but I, I, I'm, I'm not really so sure about the word teacher because, like, I'm okay with it, I suppose, but, but to me, when you're helping someone with their meditation practice, you're really you're not teaching them anything they don't already know. Mm. So it's not like there's new knowledge, you know, you might just be helping them remember something they've forgotten. Like, you know, it's that deeply ingrained in us. So the best I can hope for as a meditation guide is simply to help people rediscover that and just be there to kind of, yeah, you know, guide that process. So does that go some way to answering your question? I mean, I think even the fact that you don't think of it as teaching yeah. and as rediscovering really yeah. helps to answer that question. Do you yeah. find that the process is quite different depending on who you're working with? Well, it depends. It also depends on what their conditioned beliefs are about meditation. You know, when they, when they sit down in front of you and you guys have probably found that as well. It's like, you know, people say, you know, well, I just can't stop thinking. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you know, and let's just strip it back a little bit because if you stop thinking, you, you, you're dead. <laughs> so, you know, it's the idea of how do you manage that stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, you can have this conversation at a number of, of, of levels because you could say the same thing about stress. And one of my kind of, one of the things that sticks with me a little bit is this idea of, of, of particularly things like corporate mindfulness where, where the talk is all about eliminating stress. You know, well, you don't want to eliminate stress. Mm. Like, if we eliminated stress, we'd literally not be motivated to do anything. Mm. Mm. So it's, it's the idea of how to better manage stress. But I often see it, the marketing taglines around mindfulness is learn how to eliminate stress. Mm. I'm like, stress is, is how we evolve. Stress is, is, we, stress is a fundamental part of staying alive. It's like, you know, when a lion gets hungry, you know, they have so much stress that they get up and, you know, rip the throat out of a zebra. Mm. That wouldn't mm. happen without stress, mm. the stress of not having food. So we need that for our evolutionary progression. We need that for survival. And I'm just, I get a bit concerned sometimes with this idea of eliminating stress. In fact, again, going back to the, the Wim Hof method, which I'm sure we'll touch on later, mm-hmm. you know, part of that process is actually deliberately creating stress deliberately creating a cortisol event in your body so that you can learn how to manage it. The problem is that in, in modern times we see, th- we see stress as a threat when really we should see stress as a challenge. And the difference between those two mindsets is everything. Perhaps we can start yeah, talking about the stuff. Wim Hof yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 so how, how did you become introduced to his teaching? I knew who Wim Hof was, because mm-hmm. like, you read on the internet. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. who, this sort of crazy touch guy who had all his world records, and he just seemed like a bit of a, a sideshow. So yeah, I kind of knew what he was up to, and I actually wasn't sure if it was real or not, because he'd read it, like, I don't know, and then he was sort of selling his course, and I'm like, what is that? what's going on there but it kept coming on my radar all the time and of course I was always looking at ways of helping particularly with symptom reduction with my cancer Mm -hmm. of things that might help Mm -hmm. and it was and one night I just happened to uh, when I used to on a television I switched on and and the Vice documentary of people 
uh, you might have seen the Vice documentary on, on Wim. It's, a, it's one of the things that really hooks people in because it's quite compelling. And it was on, and I was like, oh, yeah, that guy, I'm going to watch it this time. I actually spent a bit of time focusing, and it really blew me away. Mm-hmm. It really blew me away. You know, it took a bunch of guys up, up a mountain in Poland, and some of them had, you know, some quite chronic health conditions, and lots of things were happening, and I was like, wow, this guy might be onto something, you know? So by the time the documentary finished, it was like, it was late, you know, it was like well after midnight, late, late for me. <laughs> and, um, but I just, I Googled, like, how to do the method, and I actually sat down and did it, and I felt awesome. Like I felt best I'd felt in years. And actually, even from a meditation perspective, I felt deeper in meditation through that process than I had doing any anything else. It was like, what what is this? So I got up the next day and I actually signed up for his ten week course and I did his ten week course and the rest just and then he so happened to be in Melbourne and so I went to see him in Melbourne and then I had the opportunity there to have a conversation with him and I was asking him specifically about my blood cancer and, I, and that conversation just I just felt really like connected to him personally like he just seemed yeah like somebody was really kind of speaking my language in a certain sense so I then went from there and sort of stepped through all the all the, the, the hoops of doing the various courses and modules to become a, a trainer and since in the, during that process have had you know lots of opportunity to get to know Wim and, and just it just reinforces more and more how deeply I feel about about the practice and it's just a metaphor for life actually Mm -hmm. you know aside from the the physical and mental health benefits it's just getting in an ice bath is a metaphor for facing all your fears (laughs) you know all the stuff we've talked about actually can be can be kind of talked about in the context of jumping in an ice bath and so for people who've never heard of him before what else does the practice consist of well it's basically three pillars so you've got a, a breathing technique a mindset or a focus or, or a meditation and then the cold exposure which is the jumping in the ice so all three of those things actually have benefits on their own but doing them together as a consolidated practice is really where the difference seems to come yeah so for those who don't know Wim he's just he's an extraordinary guy he's got lots of world records for mm-hmm. sitting in ice and holding his breath and, and holding himself up with one finger and lots of crazy stuff and his physiology has changed as a result of the process the method that he he does and you know the question initially was well is he just genetically different in the beginning or is it the practice which did it and i think science is playing out but it's what he's doing and it's something that a lot of athletes and kind of people looking for peak performance are drawn to right like yeah yeah i think lots of people yeah um, i think you know whether you're battling a chronic condition or whether you're just yeah looking for boosting performance or you know, even you're talking about anxiety and depression, even that, because what's really gone on there at a, at a physiological level is, you know, you're alkalizing your body, you're, you're flushing it of cytokines, which are the proteins that cause inflammation. There's lots of things going on there. So depending on what's going on for you, but, and more importantly, and most importantly, is you know, you're connecting back to your true nature. Like you're really, you know, you, you, you're having a conversation with your body chemistry. And that link is, is what we in modern times have completely lost. Like we've just completely disconnected between mind and body. So, you know, this process gives you an opportunity to kind of, again, relearn that. Relearn what we've forgotten. And is it because it's such a kind of dramatic sensation you have no choice but to be in your body? Well, I think that's part of it. I mean, yeah, that, that's definitely part of it. I mean, it's, it's not meant to be comfortable. Hmm. But the physiology, it's the, it's the idea, can you let go and let your body do what it's supposed to do? Because no harm's going to come to you sitting in the ice, but you're very fearful of that. Mm. And, so, and, and usually what happens is the first couple of minutes is, is a stressful event. It's highly... But if you can get through that, what's on the other side of that is incredibly calm, like incredibly calm. So... For me, again, that's a metaphor for life, right? You know, we, we tend to try to avoid the discomfort. But on the other side of that discomfort is where life is. And so, you know, the obstacle is the way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's standing in front of you is an ice bath. ice bath seems like a pretty big obstacle. But instead of going around it, if you go through it, you'll find what you're looking for on the other side. Yeah. What a great metaphor for life. Mm. <laughs> You're kind of making me want to have an ice bath. <laughs> like, just in your backyard. I was going to say, we're, we're, we're sitting about eight feet away That's from right, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a bit nervous now. Yeah. <laughs> 
I understand you also do heart math. Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit, perhaps? Yeah, switching gears. Well, but in actual fact, I mean, it's all related. Where to begin with heart math? I became a heart math instructor before I became a Wim Hof mm-hmm. method instructor. It's all, it's, you know, at, at the base level, it's really getting back in touch with your heart, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we talk an awful lot about mindfulness these days, but, mm-hmm. you know, I'd hasten to add that heartfulness is probably a better way of looking mm-hmm. at it. And it's this idea that the heart is the most powerful organ in the body. And the way we perceive the world around us is actually heart first. So the heart is kind of the, the integration point for all of our experiences. And yet, we kind of, if I asked you that question perhaps before we sat down and asked you where that integration point was, you probably would have pointed at your head. But it's not, it's here. And again, it's one of those things that we know but we've, we've lost touch with. So heart math kind of brings you back to, towards living a more heart conscious life, if that makes sense. You know, even from the point of view of our energy, you know, which is not a hippie thing, it's real. You know, electromagnetic energy comes from every organ, every everything in our body at different, different rates. The heart is by far the most powerful. And, you know, and the, the electromagnetic energy from the heart can be measured like 25 feet away. Mm-hmm. So when someone's in your heart energy, you can feel it if you're tuned in. You know? And you can also change someone else's frequency it's like by being loving and compassionate. Right? So yeah, this is a very long conversation, heart math, and I could go on and on. But in a nutshell, that's really kind of what, what we're looking at there. And the idea is that when our hearts and our minds are, are aligned... That's when we're in coherence. That's when we're balanced, you know? That's when everything starts to make sense and we become much more resilient, etc. So it's when we're out of whack here mm-hmm. that, you know, life becomes tricky and we're, and we're kind of in sympathetic nervous mode too much. Mm. And this just brings us back into alignment. So heart math is used a lot for different things. Again, you're talking about sports people. A lot of professional sports people use heart math, particularly people that are in high-precision events like archery or I'm pulling things out, but, you know, things where you actually have to be really settled. Mm -hmm. The NFL uses them, but they use them a lot for the punters, the ones that they've only got one thing to do, but it's got to be extraordinarily precise and, you know, heart beats up, crowds roaring, and it's important what, what happens next. And you've got to find some sort of stillness within that cacophony Mm -hmm. to do something skillful. Now, heart math's great for that because you're aligning heart and mind and everything, you know, you become internally coherent. Yeah, and you find that, you know, it's not just about being more loving and more compassionate. It helps with, you know, memory and focus and decision-making and even spatial awareness. So that's pretty cool for sort of eye-hand coordination and everything kind of lifts. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And I must say, we looked at the website, but I didn't go too deep into it does mm. it use a device to oh well, the, the device yeah the device you can actually measure coherence you can measure this alignment the unit is it's called heart rate variability HRV mm-hmm. and what it's actually looking at is the consistency of the space between your beats as opposed to how fast or slow your heartbeat is like you want to get that spacing nice and consistent so yeah for people that like that this is just a bit of kind of biofeedback you can actually measure hrv for more kind of tech-minded people who yeah we well, often see yeah. like the watches even the what even some of those fitness watches have an hrv component to them now but it's usually advertised as like how stressed are you it's like measuring stress but mm. that's it's kind of the opposite it's measuring coherency you know that measurement it's it's a bit clunky but so it's not accurate but it gives you it gives you a pretty good idea so it's definitely a worthy addition but yeah it's all talking to the same thing so yeah, I, I found heart math was kind of like one of the early things that I came across with when I got diagnosed. And the reason I decided to become an instructor was because just practicing it made a really big difference for me. Mm-hmm. This understanding, we're always really negative the way we, you know, we, we all understand that stress kills, right? Mm-hmm. We all understand that stress kills because it creates too much cortisol in our body. And that's long-term cortisol. You know, we don't understand that actually short-term cortisol events can help us. That's why the Wim Hof method is of interest. But yeah, you're right, you know, long-term cortisol is not a good idea. So we all, we all understand when I say stress kills, but what we don't understand or don't even think about is the flip side of that is that love heals, mm-hmm. right? If I bring thoughts of love and compassion and joy and gratitude and appreciation into my heart, then instead of pumping cortisol through my veins, I'm pumping DHEA, oxytocin, you know, all these hormones which are designed to make me heal. Mm-hmm. And all these positive outcomes, right? So 
you know, when we've got cortisol flowing through and we're in the sympathetic nervous mode, a lot of these subtle processes in our body switch off because you're telling the body that, you know, there's a bear around the corner and so I just need to be ready to run really fast. So, you know, it says, well, I'm not going to bother subtly repairing DNA. Yeah, yeah, I've got to deal with that yeah. the situation. So, but the other side of the coin, you know, by introducing the sort of renewing emotions is that the body can actually start to switch those processes back on again. So, you know, it's no surprise to me that somebody who does much better with a cancer diagnosis is someone who has a lot of love and compassion. Makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. If you're angry and mm-hmm. pissed off and... Then, yeah, life's just harder. Yeah, and well, yeah, and the cancer's, the cancer's just going to be like, sweet, this is, this is perfect mm-hmm. soil for me to grow. Mm. Mm. It's sort of uh, just from what you've talked about, heart method sort of seems like it's a systemized way of finding that flow state as well. I don't know if you're familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah. coherence and flow state are the same thing. Mm. Right. Yeah. So heart math call it coherence, but you mm-hmm. know you can call it in the zone, mm-hmm. flow state. Absolutely. So, you know, yes, heart math is teaching you how to be in flow state and teaching you that the science of being in flow state Mm -hmm. is incredibly good for you and incredibly good for those around you. Another thing we uh, read about you is that you are certified in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And I was wondering if you use this at all in your guiding of meditations, whether your use of language can affect people in different ways in that meditation process. I probably do use it, but not. it's probably not a conscious thing. The NLP part of what I do probably falls more into the, the work I do with private clients, and it really mm-hmm. depends on what they're, what's going on for them and mm-hmm. what needs to happen. So mm-hmm. for me, going through that course was more about... It just solidified things that I was kind of doing anyway in a common sense, but now I had a name for it. And then mm-hmm. I, and I had a whole bunch more of actual tools that I could use. But, mm-hmm. but a lot of it for me was just like, oh, good, because that's you know, just feeling into stuff that now made a lot more sense and right. seemed a lot more credible because I was now reading about them in textbooks, so I had names for things. And, but aside from that, I also learned a lot more, and I also, it gave me lots of tools that were very practical. So, you know, not so much in the, in the guiding of meditation, although maybe more than I'm aware of, mm-hmm. probably more so with the private clients. Especially if it's something that really kind of made sense of you. It sounds like it's probably something you were doing intuitively anyway, so yeah. it wasn't really a shift in how you kind of guided people, but then now there's a whole framework that you yeah. can draw from and expand on what yeah. you're already naturally doing. Yeah, and, and just, you know, feeling into situations and conversations with that I guess knowledge it's it just yeah I guess it kind of I don't know it's just more bows in your quiver I guess yeah. yeah I could imagine as well there's what works for you and then when you are working with someone who has a completely different way of going about things and different state of mind and it might be that the same practice will actually be helpful for them but sometimes you just got to like introduce it in a slightly different way and yeah well, you've hit the nail on the head I mean I think you know, the, the bottom line of NLP is it comes with the understanding that what a lot of us try to do in life is, is put our map over someone else's territory. Mm-hmm. And, that's you know, a really good way to put it. Yeah, and that's, that's the kind of the bottom line understanding of NLP is just to, to not do that, basically. <laughs> because, we, you know, I, I, if I want to help Rain, I'll come at it looking at it through my eyes, mm-hmm. not really understanding what's going on for, for the person that I'm having a discussion with, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm trying to, like, navigate his territory with my map, if that makes sense. And I can give you a great example. It's like, when my sister died, a lot of people came up to me and said things like, oh, she's in heaven now, you know, and she's with the angels and stuff. Well, I, that's not my religious background or belief, right? So whilst they were attempting to help me, they were putting their map over my territory because that actually I found more irritating like I felt worse after hearing that than better but they thought they were helping me and that's a perfect example of that yeah you know so but if they understood my territory then they could say something which was actually helpful to me Mm -hmm. it kind of feeds in as well to the idea of teaching someone as opposed to guiding them yeah. It's like helping someone find their own way yeah yeah that's it territory yeah if someone comes up with 
the solution for themselves. They're going to own it much better than me trying to tell them. Yeah, this will be good for you. (laughs) This will be good for you. Oh, you know, you hear it all the time in conversations. Here's what I'd do. Like, well, the next thing that comes out of the mouth is probably not helpful. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah that's fine for you. That's what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is your practice these days in mm. terms of physical and um, meditation and it, 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 Yeah, it changes a bit. I mean, certainly the, the, the Wim Hof stuff is, is pretty constant. Like, I'll be doing the breathing most days and that would normally end with a cold shower as opposed to an ice bath but I try to do an ice bath a couple of times a week if I, if I can but certainly the, the cold shower which is which is great and it sort of feels like, like the first thing you do is get up in the morning and you you meet a challenge it's a pretty good way to start the day mm-hmm. so that's nice in terms of meditation it kind of changes you know, I don't love talking about my personal practice because it kind of is that personal mm-hmm. but it moves around I do quite a lot of uh, guru yoga meditation, which is a a Tibetan Buddhist practice. I find that impactful, and and that practice has been with me from the beginning, so this kind of feels like home Mm -hmm. to a certain degree. But So, so, yeah, I mean, my morning routine, I I, I try to have a a kind of a ritual which which I stick to. So there'll be a little bit of meditation, there'll be the Wim Hof stuff, uh, I journal every morning, and... Yeah, even simple things like making my bed and having a cup of tea are kind of like a part of the discipline. I think making your bed is an underestimated <laughs> daily practice. It's like, and I've heard it talked about a lot, but it's like, if that's the only thing good, if that's the only thing that happens in the day, the only thing you got done, well, that's fine. Yeah. You know, because you get home after a really shit day and your bed's made, and that's like, nice. Oh. You've done something for yourself. <laughs> so I think it's a great way to start the day takes a minute but if someone else is in it that's a bit of a problem <laughs> but what yeah. is the cat on it yeah, 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 yeah. so yeah it's 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 kind of make the bed have a cup of tea meditation Wim Hof and journaling and I imagine as well your work with meditation Australia and with the people that you see through the day it's not like the meditation stops it's like no. this is my practice meditation time and I'm mindful of this is work stuff like yeah I, I imagine you'd probably stay pretty present through... Well, you, you try. And it's funny, sometimes actually guiding a meditation, like, you definitely have the feeling of meditating. Oh, it totally works. So, yeah. 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 So yeah. you are actually meditating probably even more than you realise. But so I've noticed if I'm if I'm doing some kind of... It happened yesterday, actually. I was teaching Ace Banks in Collingwood, and I really felt it afterwards. Like, I was like, whoa, that was, that was good. I enjoyed that. So, again... Is that them teaching? Mm. Like, I don't know. Like, I often say you teach what you most need to learn. Mm. So, yeah, not a bad, not a bad quote-unquote business to be in. And when you're leading a practice as well to a room of people, you have all the energy of all of those people yeah. practicing with you. Yeah, you well. do. That's right. Which can sometimes be quite tiring. Like, holding, like after the death meditation workshop, I'm pretty drained. Mm. So it also depends on what type of energy mm. you're holding. If it's all nice yeah. and bubbly and happy, like, like a Wim Hof, like a room full of people doing Wim Hof breathing is, is incredibly uplifting. But, you know, a room full of people meditating on death is profound, mm. but it's, it can be tiring. Mm. Yeah, that's not one you want to do every Thursday night. That's no, and, and, you know, the energies in the room can range from people who... You know, they're just about to lose someone, they've just lost someone, they've had a terminal illness diagnosis themselves, you know, or still holding on to grief from someone they lost years ago. Like, there's a lot of heavy stuff going on, and you're sort of trying to, you know, hold all of that in um, into a space where people feel like they can be vulnerable and all that stuff and express themselves. And so, yeah, that can be draining, whereas the Wim Hof stuff just feels like a celebration. Mm. And it sounds like with the death workshop as well, there's a lot of material that you're passing on as well. So there's the emotional side of creating a safe container for all of those people, but also you have a lot of things that you want to remember to impart and to say and yeah, they te- they to te- choose carefully. And yeah, they tend to come out differently every time, the death one, because you're right, there's, you know, in an hour and a half, there's, it could go in lots of different directions. So mm-hmm. stuff often gets left on the table, but it wasn't meant to part of it so you've just got to really like you can't overthink those ones you've just got to kind of be in it. like there's the checklist yeah there's certain things that are anchor points for me um, mm-hmm. which are generally exercises that we can do together but what happens in between those things it, it changes all the time so um yeah interesting it sounds like a great balance for a participant as well to have 
the information and then to have the embodiment practices and to move between the two states of mind? Yeah, I think so. I think that's right too. And the death one particularly, I, I think it takes a little while to actually kind of integrate what just happened. And I think that I've found just in talking to people, it's kind of 24, 48 or 72 hours later when... Oh, right, when definitely they, yeah. came home. Okay, that was incredible. I've yeah. got so much stuff to tell you about. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But if I said to someone right after the deathbed meditation, you know, share your experiences, I think it would be quite, quite tricky. So I tend to avoid that. Oftentimes it comes up in the group, someone mm-hmm. wants to share. And that's also fun. But I often find there's a lot of people sitting in the circle who, who aren't saying anything because they're still just processing Mm. so but then you get certain people who just immediately want to share which is fun and i guess there's the people who process things by talking about it and that's how they Mm. clarify you know that you're absolutely right i think you know the words are tumbling out and they're making sense of them as they're coming out Mm. yeah but i mean the other thing is in that death meditation too is i'm sharing much more of myself i'm I'm very open i'm an open book i'm I'm always sharing but Mm. in, in the death meditation it's more deliberate because you know, you need to show that it's okay to be really vulnerable around these types of topics. Mm-hmm. You know, and clearly, you know, there's some there's some parts of me that I can share which are very relevant. So, again, that's a bit more takes a bit more. It's a bit more energy draining. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have any kind of self care practices that you do for yourself, like maybe before or after leading a workshop like that? Yeah, this is again, this is sharing too. But mm. before and after the death meditation workshop I actually meditate and sit in silence with my sister and my mum because I feel like part of my story that I'm going to be sharing is intimately involving them you know and and I'm happy to answer whatever questions anybody has to ask and so I almost feel like I need to ask them permission so you know beforehand I'll ask the permission and afterwards I'll you know thank them be grateful for allowing me to to use their stories to hopefully help other people so yeah i was on friday night i was a bit I was quite upset actually like you know beforehand i was really like the, there was the first person to arrive and i was sort of like a bit upset you know but i think that's all part of it you know yeah absolutely it's mm. not something that you're sharing from a textbook it's well that's right you're sharing from your life yeah yeah mm. yeah yeah, and that's, you know, if you can be as, as real and come from the most authentic place that you possibly can be, really show up, then that's what is going to make it important for people and, and get them to do the same thing because it's just, you know, you just fall into that, right? Mm, yeah, that's the... Mm, that's the energy in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming back to this death topic, I'm just sort of wondering, you know, you've given examples of how as individuals we can sort of learn to deal with death a little bit better do you think there's anything we can do on a more cultural level that perhaps we're not doing i think there's heaps yeah i mean i mean you know quite simply Mm -hmm. culturally we've we've completely lost touch with the process of dying it's a very medicinal event now Mm -hmm. but more so than that you know would you know what to do if someone died in your house Mm -hmm. i mean you know generally now you sort of i don't know pick up the phone and dial 1-800 someone just died in my house mm. um, we, we just you know we have no idea but mm. well that's not to say we is very most of us have no idea right mm. and you're just like oh my god get this dead body out of the house I don't know but like one generation ago or even less like grandma dies and we all just click in big ear we're so culturally connected to death it's like this happens and that happens mm. so that's gone and I think if we started to bring that back we'd be directly connecting back to the dying process which would then kind of help with the denial Mm -hmm. part and it might just sort of roll out from there but I'm seeing it more and more now people like keeping the body in the home for a couple of days and having friends come around and look which is and chat and sit down and be with and Mm -hmm. that's all fabulous because it's reconnecting us to the truth right Mm -hmm. but that's pretty recent Um, but we are breaking down a lot of taboos in society and I think this one's probably the last big one Mm -hmm. you know this, this sweeping death under the carpet thing is not happening quite so much but you know what I'm saying, though? Like, yeah. I, I don't know if I said, you know, how, what happens if someone dies in your house? It's, mm-hmm. And even if you do know what to do, it's very clinical. Mm. You know, like, the coroner undertake, shows up and it's all very, just, you wash your hands of it. You're not getting 
getting into it and getting your hands dirty in the process. It's, mm. You're just, you know, you're making it some extremely clinical process, which is disconnecting. I know in a lot of um, religions, like washing the body. Is oh, yeah, part of a yeah, yeah. Process. yeah. In, in the Jewish tradition, for example, there's, there are women and that's, that's what they do. Mm-hmm. And so they prepare the body. And um, it's such a reverential and, and beautiful process. Like, mm. n- no words are, are spoken. Like even between the women, they just looks and nods and you know and, and utter respect for the body. And then at the end of the process, they actually say a prayer in Hebrew, which basically translates to, "If we've done anything to offend you during this process, like we, you know, we're really sorry," and all these types of things, which is just so beautiful. And then at the funeral itself, those women are there, but they can't even, they don't even like the say the spouse of the person that's deceased isn't to know which of the women saw the but like it's completely just kept as a sacred thing between the women involved in the body and i just think that's just beautiful yeah i'm part maori and in in our culture at a, a funeral they call it a tangi wai the the body will be sort of in the middle at the head of the the, the room for three days and everyone will be sitting around and there'll be you know pictures of the ancestors um that have passed away so you know there i think there is a, a bit of a bit more of a cultural recognition of of death there i do remember one time um because part of the process is there always has to be at least one person next to the body and i remember i was about um 12 years old and uh, one of my great uncles had passed away and I was sitting next to him and everyone else left for lunch. So I was this little um, 12-year-old kid left alone with a dead body. Oh, wow. <laughs> An so, open casket? Or? Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. yeah. And uh, yeah, mum came back about half an hour later and apologised. <laughs> oh, oh, you mean it was a mistake? It was yeah, not yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> everyone just went to lunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is an interesting side. <laughs> opportunity to contemplate death at a very young, young age. Mm. But... Um, yeah, the, the the point being that you know culturally all cultures have it in some shape or form, and I mm. think we've just we've, we've lost it. Mm. I mean, there are some beautiful you know death doulas and lots of stuff happening now, but but mm. it's it's the minority. It's not the it's definitely not common. Mm. Mm. And something I learned semi recently as well is you don't actually have to have the body embalmed if you don't want to. So no, you don't. Have, there's actually a lot of things which you don't have to do when it comes to someone dying Mm -hmm. and we just we just conditioned to believe that you've got to jump through all these hoops but in actual fact you you can maintain an awful lot of control over what happens we don't look because who wants to discover that because that would require actually having a relationship with death Mm -hmm. and it's also something that they talked about a little bit at the gola retreat like Tell people what you want to do. Ah, to totally. Your I'm, and I'm always big on that. Life. I'm always yeah. big on that. One of the practices, which is even a more simple way of doing that, is have a current playlist on your phone <laughs> for your funeral. Because when you die, everyone's like, oh, what song do you like? And uh, like for me, one of the most horrendous things I can think of is somebody playing a shit song <laughs> at, at my funeral and, and them all going, oh, you know, this is obviously a song of David. Like, no, no. So if you go to my iPhone, you'll see there's a playlist called Funeral. And I look at it, I look at it like probably once a month. And, you know, maybe a song drops out and another one comes in. You know, and, cause, and in order to have that conversation with myself to change that song requires me to have a direct conversation with death. It's like, you know what, I love that song, but there's only, gonna, there's only four songs or five songs. Oh, at it's most. like playlist. <laughs> well, that's all you got, right? Yeah. You know, and, and it's an interesting point because when mum, knowing the end was soon, we looked at music for a funeral and that ended up into a two-day extravaganza of tears and laughter as we went through a whole music collection and the memories that came with that. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, you know, at a time when, you know, yeah, you know, Either way, it wasn't going to be very long. So, you know, we were approaching it, not really sure what was going to happen, but... I'm just remembering that at my grandmother's funeral, she was being cremated, and as the casket was being lowered, apparently this was her choice. It was a terrible music version of um, Come On Baby, Light My Fire. Oh, dear. And she chose it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, she chose yeah. it. That's all fine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It's actually strangely, or like not strangely enough, when Ran got a terminal misdiagnosis, we like it's something that really helped talking about like what we were going to play at a funeral and mm. 
totally helps. It's like yeah. an unburdening, right? Mm, so, mm. Um, I sort of wanted to have a dress rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, he could like see it because it was going to be a pretty epic party that we had planned. Well, have you ever read Timothy Leary's Desire for Dying? No. It's no. Really, it's a, like it's this, you know, he basically planned his his death like a celebration of his life mm. and in the end they had a mock funeral for him with all the stuff which he was at yeah so and i think that's actually a really good idea yeah it's like one of the things that happened with, with my mum was that you know when, when we knew that as i said the end was getting close my uncle wrote a poem for mum's funeral and i remember mum lying there saying you know when i die are you going to write a poem for the funeral and my uncle Pete said, yeah, I've already written it. You want to hear it? And like, she got to hear it. Yeah. And I'm like, that's only because in our family, we had, we were able to discuss these kinds of things. Like if we were in the, the Ram Dust story that I mentioned before, where everyone's denying, mm-hmm. then mum never hears that poem. Mm-hmm. And Pete never gets to read it to her mm-hmm. in real life. Mm-hmm. And, and it so, comes right back to what you're saying of do it now. Do it now. Yeah. Do it now. Like, don't. Frank Ostaseski has a beautiful book called Five Invitations, and it's about the five things that that, that death can teach us in terms of living now. Mm-hmm. And in, then invitation number one is don't wait. And mm-hmm. you know, I think that that's the point. We uh, briefly mentioned this earlier, but you do work with Meditation Australia, and uh, you are appointed president of Meditation Australia. I was wondering if you could perhaps briefly talk about what you consider the role of Meditation Australia to be. Yeah, well, look, it's about supporting meditation teachers, Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And, you know, with with a, I guess, a big overall mission of introducing meditation to as many people as possible in Australia and and hopefully making it an integral part of their lives, yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, providing uh, teacher training, you know, um, endorsing teacher training courses that fit. So, yeah, it's it's just basically... I guess the, the peak body for the industry, helping teachers and also helping spread the word of how mm-hmm. great meditation mm-hmm. can be for people. Mm-hmm. And what do you see your role as being in that whole process? My role is no different from the role of Meditation Australia itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, within mm-hmm. that framework, mm-hmm. what can I do to facilitate that process? Mm-hmm. You know, like we've got, you, you may have seen we have these, what we call our meditation pods, which are kind of like personal development days for teachers come mm-hmm. along and discuss topics that mm-hmm. are of interest to meditation teachers and helping them kind of network and meet other teachers and grow and develop that way mm-hmm. uh, we've got a big national conference coming up in mm-hmm. july lots of both local and international speakers at that so kind of that's a first for australia mm-hmm. so it's things like that so my involvement you know will revolve around you know playing a key role in the conference mm-hmm. or you know emceeing those panels at the meditation pod but at the end of the day it's just all pulling in that direction Mm -hmm. just getting the word out there about meditation and supporting the network of teachers nationally any way we can and providing a i guess a pathway for people that that want to become teachers i guess all these things that you've learned in your life experience and all all these the sort of knowledge and wisdom you have to give do do you feel that that is something that can enhance what you give to meditation australia and what meditation australia can provide to the country i guess i hope so i mean Mm -hmm. i think there's 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 some incredibly wise and terrific people in meditation australia and the thing Mm -hmm. is we all come from we all have different backgrounds and we all have different uh roots in terms of our meditation practices Mm -hmm. and you know meditation australia is it's an umbrella for all of that stuff so it doesn't Mm -hmm. really matter kind of secular non-secular it's mm. all it's all embodied so yeah sure I, I, I hope that I have some skills to bring to the table but then mm. I also know that I'm surrounded by people who have other incredible skills and hopefully mm-hmm. together it's, it's a nice well-rounded picture mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what would you consider to be the biggest challenges ahead in this type of endeavor <laughs> around um, around all that yeah I mean look, there's always going to be going to be challenges there's lots of stuff that we're looking at doing you know, some of which there's obstacles, mm-hmm. uh, others of which are a little bit easier. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, as long as we, we're continuing to kind of grow the, grow the base in a way which is, which is not getting ahead of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll start to do more and more stuff. But, geez, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I could talk about, you know, um, <laughs> some of which will happen soon, hopefully, and some of which will take a long time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's just a matter of kind of rolling the ball forward. Mm-hmm. As I said, you know, anything that can be done to, to kind of 
help the practice of meditation grow mm. um, and become an integral part of, of what we all do as Australians. I think anything that kind of helps that to happen is something that we would consider. My last question, it's maybe a difficult question to answer, but I guess <laughs> what would your utopian society look like if all the things that you've learned could be sort of thrown out into the world <laughs> if, if such a thing were possible what what would society look like <laughs> just a little one to ponder i don't know i just think as long as it's fueled by love and compassion i'm mm-hmm. happy because i think that that's really the make or break mm-hmm. i think you know we're powered by love and i think at the moment where i see all the disruption occurring it's where that's that's not happening and you know at some level i mean i do a lot of work in the men's circles right and mm-hmm. you know for me it kind of starts within myself and there's this idea of kind of union of, of my masculine and feminine energies within myself mm-hmm. yeah and i think you with me mm-hmm. you know? um, mm-hmm. and i think that's even at that level i think it's been a bit distorted mm-hmm. um, and i think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing out there at the moment which is causing issues in societies around that, that, that and people really not understanding that balance even within themselves mm-hmm. but i think you know the next step in that level is kind of aligning the masculine and feminine in terms of your relationship with another person mm-hmm. and that doesn't have to necessarily be between a man and a woman either it's still it's still a union of masculine and feminine at some mm-hmm. level right mm-hmm. and then the next step above that is is the union of masculine and feminine at, at a kind of universal level and to me if we can get all those things right then all the discord and everything else is going to go away but what gets that to be right is that it's all underscored by love right so, yeah. Yeah. Does that Sounds answer like the question? Sounds like a great basis to build a society upon. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's kind of, kind of where I'm at, like off the top of my head in terms of answering that question. Mm-hmm. It seems like such a perfect and simple answer. Yeah. <laughs> not so not much in, uh, in reality sometimes no. it feels, mm-hmm. but it actually is pretty simple. Mm. But, you know, we, we seem to get it wrong. Mm. We make it complicated for ourselves. We, we do. We just, mm. but that's that's what we humans tend to do. We tend to like overcomplicate everything. Mm. You know, I've often I've got this lovely quote: "It takes a long time to understand nothing." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if you can just let go, everything will be fine. <laughs> so, I guess does that bring us on to picks of the week? Yeah. Yep. I would definitely pick on March the 9th here, um, where we're sitting right now. A very very dear friend of mine by the name of Stefan Skov is going to be playing his live album that is coming up for launch in March, but he's going to come and do an acoustic version for a thing that I host called Mindful Vinyl, which is like a monthly meditation sit where we normally sit and listen to a, uh, an album from cover to cover. Because remember in the old days, like, you know, I, if you're, if, uh, certainly in my old days anyway, I'm, I'm 50 this year, you know, you'd buy the new album and you'd have a listening party, people would come over and you'd sit and you'd, it would be like a meditation, no one would say anything and you'd put it on and it was very, you know, even, even the act of sort of putting the record on the record player was something ri- ritual and meaningful and you'd play it and so it's this idea of bringing that back, you know, along with the understanding of how important music is to us. But, so my friend Stefan, he's actually the music therapist at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Right. Um, so he works in music therapy with people, end-stage cancer patients. So he's a pretty incredible dude just for doing yeah. that. But then, so his energy is amazing. But then to have him come here and, and, um, and play, uh, particularly when he's got a, a new album coming out, is going to be particularly special, I think. That sounds so, great. Yeah. Mm. So I'd certainly recommend coming to that. Yeah. And anyone who's spent any time with Stefan just knows that like, he doesn't even need his guitar. He can just walk into the room and it'd be a good experience. So there's my pick. Beautiful. Nice. Sounds fantastic. My pick of the week is the book I'm currently reading, which is Why Buddhism is, is True by Robert Wright. And that's a great book on more the meditation aspects of Buddhism, why, why it seems to work and, and be you know scientifically applicable he goes into a bit of neuroscience on how the mind works uh what might be happening during meditation so it's a really good read and i recommend it absolutely i'm just going to chip in there but because i love his metaphor around weeds and plants from that book right yeah i'm not sure i've got to that part yet oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah oh no only in the sense that you know it's essentially that old thought that you know a weed doesn't know it's a weed and it's 
yeah. So yes, yes, I have read that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and that you know essentially that little definition that we have there. It's such a great metaphor for the way we look at everything in life. And I think he was even going so far as to say that it was. I think he grew up and his dad, there's a particular weed in his garden that, that you know, he, he just always grew up thinking that's a weed, that's, mm-hmm. that's bad. Mm-hmm. And then I think he was uh, on a meditation retreat or something and he, he's, I'm, 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 this could be slightly off, but he saw mm-hmm. that, that weed and he just saw it through different eyes and it was actually mm-hmm. quite beautiful. And he was like, well, what made me think it's just a label, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know? And it just opened the door to, to sort of understanding for him. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yeah. I, I'm on board with your pick, my friend. <laughs> beautiful. I think it might be a permaculture saying that a weed is just a plant growing somewhere we don't want it to. Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and you can take that. Just you can take you can take that and run with it. You know mm. what I mean? It's just a, it's a it's a metaphor for a lot of things. Oh, well, my pick of the week is a weekend away that I'm teaching at called Hoops Away, hosted by Hoop Sparks. Um, Donna and Hallie are amazing hula hoop teachers, and we've spoken to both of them on the podcast. So they'll be they'll be practicing and teaching. And if you haven't hula hooped before, it's actually it can be very meditative and like a great gateway into that flow state because you're kind of in this middle of this pattern that you're creating for yourself that can sometimes go the way you're planning, sometimes a surprise happens, sometimes a surprise turns into something amazing. And it's a great way to kind of bring you into your body and into the present moment. So yeah. I'm really excited about it. I'll be teaching yoga and Pilates and self mind fascia release and leading some meditations. Web address we'll put in the show notes, but it's hoopsparks.com slash hoops away. And that's coming up 20th to the 22nd of July in Hillsville. At Matrupa. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, great venue. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us, David. It's been a fantastic conversation. I, yeah, I, I found it absolutely wonderful. So. Me too. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. So you may have noticed that David's pick was actually on the 9th of March, which has now sadly passed. But Stefan Koff is holding a monthly event at the Fifth Direction called Music and the Mind. And we were lucky enough to go to that last event, which David talked about, and it was amazing. We really want to get Stefan on the podcast. He is an amazing personality and amazing talent. So look out for that soon. Also, Joe and I were lucky enough to just do a Wim Hof ice bath and the breathing technique, and it was completely amazing. I had to jump out after two minutes. I just... I just could not handle anymore, but I really want to do it again. Joe was in there for four minutes. That's just amazing. So she's probably going to lord that one over me for a while, but no, it was an amazing experience. I can't wait to do it again. So next episode, we're back to our fortnightly schedule, and it's an interview with movement coach and GMB trainer Connor O'Shea. I had a great time at a workshop he facilitated recently and in our interview he shares his thoughts on movement, mindfulness and in living a happy life. So look out for that one. Now if you haven't already we would absolutely love it if you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean or wherever you get your podcast from. It would really help us spread the word. And finally, we would really love to hear from you. You can drop a note on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or look out for us on Facebook or Twitter. If you have anything to share about the episode, if anything resonated with you, we would love to hear from you. Theme song in this podcast is Baby Robots by GoSoul and used with permission. Do yourself a favor and get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thanks again. Big, big love. <laughs>